three, two, one, go. All right, welcome to our second webinar. We did our first webinar a few weeks ago called How to Answer Any Question. And uh, there was an amazing response, Baruch Hashem, and people wanted more of this type of learning. What do I mean by this type of learning? What I mean is that if you go to soulwords.org, which is my website where I put all my classes and all my speeches, basically what you get there is um, Torah classes or lectures on Torah subjects, because that's, that's what I'm all about. That's my passion. That's what I care about. Um, and when I'm teaching a Torah subject, obviously, I try to bring out the relevance by relating it to practical examples, right? Because Torah isn't just information. Torah, in fact, the word Torah means peiro, instruction, guidance. So whenever I teach a Torah subject, I try to show how it is applicable to a real-life situation. Okay. However, sometimes and this is the feedback that I'm getting, people want to do it the opposite way. Instead of starting with a Torah concept and showing how it has practical relevance, do it the opposite, reverse engineer it. Start with the issues that people are facing in life, and then bring out the Torah sources in order to address those practical issues. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm obliging. I'm doing this uh, webinar called How to Work on Yourself. And obviously, what it really amounts to is, is, <laughs> is a Torah class, but it's sort of a reverse Torah class because we're not starting with the agenda of teaching Torah. We're starting with the agenda of answering a question that people are dealing with in their lives. But we know, because all truth is from Torah, and then the, ultimately, um, you know, Torah is the best of Torah. You know, it's the best merchandise. So that's what we're going to end up learning and teaching. But uh, we're starting from the premise of, okay, we've got this issue. What do we do about it? All right. So uh, I want to begin by discussing <laughs> the occupational hazard of working on yourself. Somebody said to me, by the way, that in the last webinar about ha how to answer questions, that they liked that I used the term occupational hazard a lot. I don't know how many times is a lot, but I do like that term. I like the term occupational hazard. Um, I like being aware of the pitfalls. doesn't mean that you have to avoid a path just because you know there are places where you might stumble. It just means that you need to uh, be prepared before you embark on that path. So let's talk about some of the, um, the risks, the risks that you run when you're working on yourself. I'm going to start off with a, with a Hasidic parable. Um, once upon a time, and you know what a parable is. It's a story that never happened, but it's true anyway. So once upon a time, the Malach HaMovis, that means in Hebrew, the angel of death, came to Hashem, came to God. And he complained, the angel of death told God, my name is bad for business. Because the angel of death's job is to punish people. Um, but in order to punish them, he has to ensnare them and catch them and then prosecute them. And uh, he says, my name is scary. <laughs> so nobody wants to do business with me. So he tells God, I got to gotta get a DBA, you know, doing business as. Um, so God says, okay, no problem. I, I get it. You know, people don't want to talk to a guy named, named Angel of Death. So uh, call yourself um, Yetzirah, which means the evil inclination. So the Angel of Death went back down to earth, and he called himself Yetzirah, the evil inclination. And uh, he came back to God after a while and said, it's still no good because it has the word evil in the name. <laughs> I need to trip people up. My job is I got to make them make the worst decisions of their lives, but they think it's a good decision, right? So, uh, but it has evil in the name, so it's showing my cards. I got I got to get a new name. So God says to the angel of death slash uh, Yetzirah, meaning uh, evil inclination, he says, okay, fine. I got a new name for you. Satan. Satan is uh, adversary. 
So go try that one out. So he tries it out. He comes back and says, God, adversary, that was supposed to work. When I'm about to close the deal, people are like, what's your name? I'm like, uh, Sutton. They're like, well, what does it mean? I'm like, uh, don't worry. It's a Hebrew name. No, but what does it mean? Uh, adversary. Adversary. Who's adversary? My adversary? Get out of here. Fly a kite. So it's not working, God. So God says to the angel of death slash evil inclination slash adversary. Okay. So try this name. This, this name is actually almost cute. It's like fuzzy. <laughs> it's a fuzzy, cute name. Um, the, Chassidim, uh, the Chassidim made up a name for you called um, Nefshabamis, which means animal soul. Call yourself animal soul. And maybe you'll be able to trip people up with that name. So uh, the angel of death slash evil inclination slash adversary goes do back down to earth as animal soul. And uh, he comes back to God after a while and says, God, it's still no good because... I'm about to close the deal, and people are like, what's your name again? I'm like, Animal Soul. They're like, Animal, Animal. You know, I'm just not comfortable taking life advice from an animal. And then, you know, I'm, then they, they go away. They're like, oh, yeah, I'll get back to you. Yeah, I'll call you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a website? I'll follow up. <laughs> then they never follow up. What's with that? I, I can't do business with this name. So God says to the... Uh, Angel of death slash evil inclination slash adversary slash animal soul. Okay. Okay. I didn't want it to come to this, but you make a very valid point. I'm going to have to give you another name. Oh, wow. This name. I, I, scary to give you this name because it's going to be so effective. In fact, if I give you this name, it's really the perfect name for your job, for what you do. Because if I give you this name, everyone will listen to you. Not only they will listen to you, they will listen to you even when their loved ones tell them the opposite. And they will always think that you have their interests at heart, no matter how destructive your advice is. And the uh, angel of death slash evil inclination slash adversary slash animal soul says, God, please lay it on me. What's my name? And God says, your name is Yesh. Yesh. Existence. Ego. And and that's it. Yes, I exist. Conscious existence. And uh, so since that time, the angel of death slash evil inclination slash adversary slash animal soul has been doing business under the name Conscious Existence. And business has been so booming that he hired a delegate to specialize on each and every one of us. The point of the parable is that self-consciousness truly is the devil. When Adam and Eve were in the garden before the fall, life was perfect because they had no sense of self-awareness. And they ate from the tree of knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Self-knowledge. But I don't mean self-knowledge in the sense of epiphany, but self-knowledge in the sense of self-awareness, crippling self-consciousness. And that's when they experienced toxic shame. They knew they were naked. They knew they were naked before, cognitively. It just didn't mean anything. In fact, the Lubavitcher Rebbe once said that before the sin of the tree of knowledge, a person would be no more embarrassed of his reproductive organs than you are embarrassed of the arm on which you wrap to fill it. It's just a body part that you use for a mitzvah. Why should it be embarrassing? It only becomes embarrassing when you have self-awareness, and through self-awareness, you, you experience God's separation, and then you become uh, savvy, sophisticated in figuring out how to do a hack, a life hack, a workaround, and how to use yourself in ways other than the way you were designed to be used. And there's shame in that. And that's where Adam and Eve began to experience shame. When they, when they felt that they could hack themselves to be in a, to, to live in a way that wasn't the way that they were designed. And ever since that time, ever since the sin of the tree of knowledge, we have been living with the curse. You know what the curse is? 
for eating from the tree of self-knowledge? Self-knowledge. You don't think that's a curse? Of course it's a curse. The conscious ego is the root of all mental dis-ease. Of course it is. All emotional dysfunction. Of course it is. So, <laughs> now we're going to work on ourselves. Do you see why that might be internally or inherently risky? Do you understand why that might be inherently risky? My whole problem is self-awareness. Now I'm going to pay even more attention to myself. And you see that it happens. Oh, Oh, do you see? You see that there are people who, in the name of working on themselves, become even more self-obsessed than they were when they were supposedly sick. Their version of getting well is sicker than what they were like when they were sick. Because the working on oneself is actually just an even more intensified version of the self-obsession that was the disease. And the more self-obsessed a person becomes, the more unreasonable they become, the more that you're, in, you're stuck in, a, in, a, in, a, in an endless loop because you can't get a reality check, right? That's the whole problem with, with being self-referential and being stuck in your bubble is you just you can't get objectivity and therefore you can't break out of it. You just get more and more and more ensnared in it and you rationalize and rationalize and rationalize. And you know what it means to rationalize, rational lies a lot of smart ideas being misused to justify whatever loop it is that i'm stuck in so it's a risky thing and and in that sense um should i say this i mean i guess i'm halfway saying it already I'm not sure how comfortable I am making this statement, but uh, I'll, I'll put it out there just to something I wonder. I'm not saying it definitively, but I, I certainly do wonder <clears throat> if it weren't, um, maybe some people would be better off not working on themselves at all. <sighs> yeah. Because the solution sometimes causes more problems than, than the problem. Or causes a bunch of new problems. And, uh, you know, at least the old problems, we had a lifetime to learn how to adapt and to cope and to cover. The new problems sometimes, <clears throat> you know, you see when somebody's supposedly getting well, things unravel even more quickly than when they were sick. Okay, so that's, that's certainly a description of the problem. Um, let's talk about the solution. If you were with me in the last webinar about answering questions, I think you probably remember me saying that every problem really is the solution, that every question really contains the answer. So to here, in this case, the problem itself contains the solution. There are different ways of working on oneself. There is when you take what you already are and you build upon it. And then there is when there's a systemic failure, when there's rot in the foundation and you have to tear the structure down and rebuild from scratch. Mm -hmm. 
the first kind of self-improvement where you are taking a self and merely improving it is the one that is going to have the highest risk of leading to more and more self-obsession. However, the second kind of self-improvement where actually you temporarily have no self, where you lose yourself, where you hit rock bottom, as they call it, and experience ego death, usually not by choice, usually imposed by or precipitated by some crisis. That's just the fact how it normally happens to people. But when someone experiences that bottoming out uh, condition, then there's a special, call it a sirotzain, a special propitious time, a window opens up where you can start building in a healthy way because the ego has been removed. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe you didn't want it to be removed. Maybe you didn't ask for it to be removed, but your situation in life has caused that. And now you have a special opportunity to start working on a brand new self without becoming self-obsessed because there is no self to be obsessed with. Maybe I'll describe it in, in, in biblical terms. <clears throat> we, we know about um, the rhythm of Jewish time. Jewish time is cyclical. Um, it's described as a spiral staircase that every year we come back full circle, but on a higher level, right? So each year when we come back to Rosh Hashanah, let's say, the world is being judged, but it's being judged on a higher level, on a loftier level than ever before, and renewed on a higher level than ever before. We come back to Yom Kippur, and it's atonement again, but it's on a higher level than ever before. Pesach is freedom, you know, on a higher level than ever before. The, there's, there's a time of year in which self-improvement is embedded. In fact, it is the, basically the theme of a significant time of year. It's, a, it's seven whole weeks during which the focus is self-refinement. It's known as Sphira, Sphira Sa'imir. And it is the 49 day period between Pesach and Shavuos. Now, what's interesting is that when the Jewish people came out of, Pes uh, came out of Egypt on, on Passover, on Pesach, they experienced rock bottom they were so low that if they'd stayed in Egypt for another moment, they would have been irretrievably lost. They're on the brink of extinction. And finally, when they did get out of Egypt, they did not leave by their own power. They could never have left on their own power, even if they were given a million years to conspire to do so. When they finally left Egypt, they were removed God took them out of Egypt and did for them what they could not do for themselves. The symbol of this ego death, of this humility, is matzah. Matzah is flat. Matzah represents the complete deflation of ego, which was the sum total of 210 years of servitude and uh, brutality stuck in truly stuck stuck in a situation that we could never extricate ourselves from and indeed we never did extricate ourselves we were removed by a power greater than ourselves <sighs> the counting of the aimer 
which is the self-refinement process, where we start day one with chesed shebe chesed, kindness of kindness, and the second day, gvore shebe chesed, uh, self-discipline within kindness, and so on and so forth. That happens after the ego has completely been crushed flat like matzah. So if you look at the natural rhythm, the natural cycle, of self-refinement in the Jewish calendar, you see that self-refinement follows ego death. And it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. After the surrender, where we allow God to pull us out of a situation that we have no ability to remove ourselves from, that's when we begin to build a new self. When that process culminates, and in the case of the Jews in the wilderness, it took 49 days. 49 days after Passover, after the Exodus, they were standing at Sinai, and they experienced divine revelation. God spoke to them face to face, like prophets, a nation of prophets. They experienced absolute uh, intimacy with God. This event is commemorated and coincides with uh, another holiday. Just like Passover is at the beginning of the 49-day period, Shavuos is at the end or the culmination of the 49-day period. It's the 50th day. On Shavuos, in the times of the temple, they would bring a special sacrifice. Every Jewish holiday had special sacrifices. But on Shavuos, they had a special sacrifice that was a bread sacrifice. Loaves of bread, two loaves of bread. And they were chametz, leavened bread. You see what happened? At the beginning of the process, when we were still in Egypt, we were matzah. We had to be matzah. Because if there were any semblance of ego remaining, we would have had too much attachment to allow God to remove us from our situation. We would have resisted the surrender. So we had to be flat. We had to be matzah. Total ego deflation. But then we work on ourselves for 49 days. We, we look at our character. We, we refine our character. And then at the end, we become like the puffy leavened bread that is brought as a sacrifice in the, in the temple on Shavuos. In other words, ego went, in 49 days, ego went from absolute poison to neutral to holy. By the time it's Shavuos and the leavened bread is being used as a sacrifice, as something holy, the, 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 this represents the, the ego having completely been transformed. And now the self is a holy self. And now self-esteem has no bad side effects. Because the self-concept is really a God concept. The ego death of Passover allowed one to surrender fully to God, to accept unconditionally God's everythingness, and my selfhood merely as an extension of him. And now when I get my ego back, it's not my old ego. It's a brand new, a brand new ego, which is not only no longer uh, poison, but it's holy, fitting to be brought as a sacrifice on the altar in the temple. So that's really, in a nutshell, a description of healthy self-improvement. It starts from nothing. It starts from nothing. Now, the question is always, you know, what is bottom? Is there an objective uh, definition of bottom? 
And uh, I say it's pretty obvious that there isn't an objective definition of bottom because you see so many people having so many different bottom experiences. You know, how do you objectively describe what the worst day of someone's life looks like? I know plenty of people who the worst day of their life, they were still married with two cars in the garage and their kids were still talking to them. And yet it was the worst day of their life. And you can't minimize it because whatever amount of emotional pain they were in, that was more emotional pain than they wanted to ever be in ever again. And so for them, that was bottom. And then conversely, you see people who've lost everything and they're still hanging in there. And apparently that's not bottom. I mean, they've, they've crossed every red line and they, they, you would think you've been, you, you've been to a hundred bottoms already and it's not for that. So my point is only that bottom is clearly a relative term or, or like some say, when do you hit bottom? When you quit digging. It's relative to the person. But whatever definition, whatever personal definition of bottom you have, the common denominator is surrender. Now, this begs the question. If I'm nothing, if I've surrendered, I gave up, I'm crushed. Why am I working on myself? Like, why, why do I care anymore? If I'm still hanging in there, if I still have, you know, a thread to hang from, okay, I'm still working. I'm still trying to, still trying to prove myself, still trying to build back the trust and all the bridges that I burned, right? But if you're telling me, no, it's all gone, it's all over, the, the, the bridges are all burned, you know, so who cares anymore? You got the question. And this question actually has probably the most important answer, um, or the, the answer to this question, probably the most important idea in, uh, in working on yourself. The answer is, you're asking me, do I want to work on myself? Do I want to improve? Do I want to be better? <laughs> I gave up wanting, I gave up wanting because every time I wanted something and I pursued it, I got hurt. It blew up in my face. I hurt others. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not pursuing anything anymore. Even what I perceive to be a grand ideal. I'm not doing it. No. I have to work on myself because I have to work on myself. Not because I've chosen to improve my life but because God demands it of me. You understand? It's a totally different flip. It's not for me. I gave up. It's for him. He demands it of me. He made me. He gave me my potential. And he expects me to make the best of the potential he gave me. You know, there's the old Hasidic explanation of that verse in uh, the book of Genesis where God says, Nasa Odim let us make a man in our image. Right? And it's always, I mean, Rashi in the commentary there deals with it, but it's a, it's a famous verse because it, um, it can lead to heretical mistakes. You know, the plural, God speaking in the first person plural, we, let us, let's make a man. And anyways, there are classical explanations to that, but there, there's a Hasidic explanation as well. Nasa Odim, let's make a man, is God speaking to each one of us and saying to you, together, let's make a man, let's make a man. This is our project together. So, if self-improvement is because I want a better life, forget it. It's just more self-obsession. 
But if self-improvement is because it is demanded from me, it is required of me by my maker that I submit to a partnership where I maximize my potentials, now that's real self-improvement, not self-obsession. To the contrary, if you ask me, I'm done. But I'm not allowed to check out. I'm not doing this for me. I gave up on having a better life. I'm doing this because my maker requires it of me. Now, I just want to sort of tone down my uh, the rhetoric over here for a second and, 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 and be very uh, transparent about the fact that I'm aware that there are people who work on themselves as a hobby, you know, just for the heck of it, because why not, you know, it would be good to be better. And I'm, I'm not here to disparage that. Um, but as I described, there is certain, certainly an inherent risk involved in that kind of approach. And uh, from a religious, from a believing, a faith perspective, a God conscious perspective, which is what I try to take, you know, I try to take a, a God conscious perspective on everything. Um, the only real legitimate reason for self improvement is because God demands it of you. It's not for me, it's for Him. What that also means, I see somebody posted here in the, in the chat, by the way, I think when I asked, if I gave up already, why am I bothering to work on myself? Somebody wrote, because that's full bittle. That's full humility. And, the, and you're 100% correct. You're right. That is the full surrender. Is I don't even care about myself anymore, but God cares about me. And therefore, if I have submitted to God's will, I have to take care of myself. I have to rebuild myself. Not for me, but for him, 100%. Um, I want to share with you something that uh, I think illustrates the concept of radical self-transformation where there's a bittle process or a uh, bottoming out or ego death stage before radical re, uh, reinvention of self. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. And I'm going to check this out. Okay, we're on soul words here, right? Uh, okay, here we go. If you want to be something incomparably greater than you've ever been, then you have to lose everything that you've ever had. And the metaphor for that is the seed. Take a seed. A seed is meant to become a tree. That's what its destiny is. But if the seed doesn't want to stop being a seed, just wants to become bigger and bigger of a seed, what's going to happen? You can have a seed that is a thousand times bigger. You have a seed that's a million times bigger than what it started as. What are you going to get? You're going to get a big, giant seed. The only way that seed's going to become a tree is you put it in the ground, you bury it alive, and it starts to rot and decompose. And when it loses all semblance of its old structure, when it's completely wasted, you know, you had a perfectly good seed, and, uh, you know, a bird could eat it, I suppose. I mean, it has its own uh, value. And then you throw it in the dirt, you throw it away, it becomes ruined. And then when it's completely broken down, it becomes a tree. So there's a saying that when you're down to nothing, God's up to something. If you want to become something incomparably greater, if you want to be comparably greater, you want to matriculate, if you want to go from level 1 to 10 or 10 to 100 or even 1 to a million, then you can just build upon what you've had. But if you're ready to be completely reinvented, to be something completely new, that only happens when uh, you let go of everything you've ever been. Okay. All right. 
here we are back it's a fun little video um I made that a couple of years ago it's really brooker animated that and my uh, brother david produced that yeah anyway um let's continue talking about the uh reduction of the ego as the sort of impetus for our growth um practically speaking what is this what does this do for us what does this knowledge do for us well one thing it does for us is it allows us to realize that emotional pain is our teacher wherever we're experiencing uh dis-ease wherever we're experiencing conflict especially if it's repeated especially if it's a if it's a pattern that is alerting us to where our ego has outgrown its functionality you know there's a story a guy went to his rabbi who was the tzemach tzedek uh the third rabbi of chabad oh there's a picture of him right there see the picture of the rabbi in white right over my shoulder there that's the tzemach tzedek he's the grandson of uh that rabbi the alta rabbi okay anyways um there's a story a chassid went to the Tzemach Tzedek in Yechidus in a private audience and he complained. He said that everyone in shul is being mean to me. Now, the way that he said it actually was interesting. Um, it's an idiom and it works in English as well. But he said, everyone in shul steps all over me, right? They step all over me. Now, I don't know what that means, you know, literally how they offended him but basically he wanted something in shul and they weren't giving it to him or you know they were they weren't treating him the way he wanted to be treated so he said when I, you know everyone in shul is stepping all over me which is a little bit immature if you think about it, you have the opportunity to meet with a spiritual master who knows your soul better than you know it and you could ask anything for any guidance and you go like you're you know tattling to a uh kindergarten uh, lunchroom monitor you know the kids are being mean to me but that's what he did that's what he did and he, he told uh, the Tzemach Tzedek um, you know uh, the guys in shul are stepping all over me so the Tzemach Tzedek said to him and what can they do if you spread yourself out over the entire shul everywhere someone steps is on you now, I want to explain something to you. The Tzemach Tzedek, that wasn't a zinger. That wasn't like a, a, you know, gotcha. That wasn't like a, you know, Don Rickles insult comic. Okay. Um, that was loving spiritual advice. The Tzemach Tzedek was explaining the mechanics of what was happening. What does it mean to spread yourself out over the entire show? Let's go back. Remember, we were talking about Passover and matzah okay so let's go back to that imagery of flat egoless matzah and puffy leaven okay so spreading yourself out spreading yourself out that means overextending the ego what does it mean overextending the ego well you know the ego has a purpose it, it, it's, it's it, the ego was made by god for a purpose and and it's god-given functionality is necessary like everything that god made in his world it, it has you know it's necessary um, it keeps us alive it's the instinct for self-preservation which we require in order to remain in a body so that we can remain souls and bodies and perfect this world which is what god wants so we do need to have that ego um the problem is when it exceeds its functionality 
So instead of reminding me to eat, it reminds me to, you know, make sure to stand at the buffet at the Kiddush and get the last brownie before the kids come, you know, and gobble it up, right? Or instead of telling me, you know, to procreate, it makes me obsessed with getting that kind of affirmation through those types of you know relationships or instead of telling me to be a social creature and be around people it tells me to be a social climber and to uh, you know be obsessed with getting uh you know social proof of my worthiness and, and affirmation and and so on and so forth the point is the basic needs of the ego are god-given um, they're not holy, but they're certainly not evil. And if they're kept small, they're functional. But what happens is, for whatever reason, and I'm not going to get into it right now, uh, tomorrow night I want to speak a little bit about healing from trauma, a little bit. But uh, a whole webinar could be done just on that topic. But I'll say, why the ego starts to become twisted, why it starts to outgrow itself. Sometimes it's in response to trauma. You know, <laughs> scar tissue, you know, is puffier than, you know, than, than regular uh, skin, right? Sometimes something got hurt and now it's like projecting out. Uh, other times it, it wasn't a trauma. It's just, look, that's one of the risks that happens when souls come into bodies and they have this ego and it, it's just one of the things that happens when you're in the uh, in a physical world full of physical stimuli, and sometimes uh, you just end up getting hooked on those stimuli. And uh, I'm not going to get into the, the the reasons why it happens because it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant, and I and I'm pretty sure that for most people, it's a combination of factors. And and since we can't prevent it from happening to people anyway, why talk about it? Like, if by identifying the factors, how the ego started to get puffy, we could go, you know, save children from it happening to them in the first place, then maybe I'd want to go examine it. But I'm not so sure it can be prevented or it should be prevented. I think that that's part of the human experience. Part of the human experience is uh, the ego becomes uh, dysfunctional. It outgrows its functionality. Now, to what extent, to what extent? You know, you put on an extra 10 pounds and you put on an extra 100 pounds, right? How, how, how much is the ego poking out? And not how much, not only how much, but where, you know, <laughs> which direction, you know, what aspect of my ego is, is overextending, right? My need for approval. Is it my need for security? Is it my uh, need for control? I'm just giving examples of things, you know, that the ego wants. Well, how to find that out? Real easy. <laughs> I just look and find out where I keep getting hurt. Now, before I, before I continue, I want to make it clear. I'm not siding with those who inflict pain on us. Trust me, I'm not siding with them. Although it's kind of funny to speak in these terms since all of us are also them and all of them are also us. Just like you've been hurt, you've also hurt others we've on both sides. And I'm not here to, uh, you know, compare who got hurt worse or did I receive more abuse than I gave? That's not, that's not relevant and that's not helpful. Okay. All I'm going to say is I'm not justifying those who have done wrong to us. They did wrong, and they will have to answer to God, but I am not their judge, and, and I don't want the job of being their parole officer. I don't want to be involved in their case. God can take care of it, okay? So set aside the culpability of those who have harmed us and looking just at the wound that I have experienced, that wound is very, very, very educational. Because when I see where I'm getting hurt, I can find out where my ego is poking too much. 
So just like that guy, he's going into shul and getting stepped on. Well, I can tell you something. He didn't say he's going home and getting stepped on. He's going to work and getting stepped on. Apparently, there's something about shul. Maybe he wanted an aliyah. Maybe he wanted to be chazan. I have no idea. Maybe he wanted to give a speech at the Kiddush. I don't know what his ego wanted, but it was sticking out. Okay, when he walks into shul, his ego starts grasping tentacles of an octopus. He's gra grasping for things. And when he's all spread out, trying to gra grab things and get his needs met, he gets stepped on. Because if you're spreading out your net, trying to get met, obviously people who are going about their business are going to step on you. And I'm not even talking about unscrupulous people who are going to actually take advantage of it and 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 take advantage of the fact that you're a needy. I'm even talking about people who are somewhat oblivious to it and they just don't realize that you're very sensitive in this particular area. They didn't know that by not giving him an aliyah one minute, he was going to put them on his, his enemy list for the rest of his life, right? <laughs> you ever found that out, that you like really hurt somebody in a deep way that you had no idea it was that hurtful to them because they attributed certain meaning to it that, that you could not even fathom sure it's happened to me and I, it's happened from me of course of course anyone who's lived a life has been on both sides of this the, the point is that my pain is my teacher my pain is my teacher my pain is my teacher the areas of life that are most difficult for me and I'm going to own this, okay? If this is too hard for you to hear me saying it to you, I'm not saying it to you. I'm saying it to me. I'm genuinely saying it to me. Wherever I repeatedly experience frustration and pain, that is precisely the area where I got to go and check. Again, it doesn't excuse others who may be mistreating me, but their mistreatment of me is a sin, and sins are answerable to God. They don't have to answer to me. I don't need them to answer to me. Trust me, I don't want my abuser to come and use me as an amateur therapist, okay? I don't need them to come with their maudlin apologies. You know, like, leave me alone, all right? <laughs> it's better, let me just take stock and say, you know, remember that old country western song? Looking for love in all the wrong places, right? Where do I keep showing up? Where do I keep insisting on showing up? even though I keep getting hurt. And I don't mean a physical emotion, although perhaps it could be that too, like the story of the guy who kept getting hurt in shul. But I mean, what situations, what relationships? You know, when I look back through my life I, and I see the, the damaged relationships, do I see a pattern emerge? And, what I'll, and if I do see a pattern, usually what it is, I find that the relationships where I got hurt the worst were the ones in which I was the neediest, where I needed the most. And it, it sounds terrible, not fair. Well, because I was needy, I got hurt. <sighs> Again, it's not right when people take advantage of our emotions. But... I'm not interested in taking their inventory. I got to take my inventory. And it's very, very educational for me to realize this, that the patterns, the recurring patterns in my life where I experience pain, frustration, disappointment, conflict, um, those areas where I have to examine whether my ego is just way too hungry. And I have to use those, precisely those painful situations as my laboratory for growth. The great irony. Here's the great irony. You know what people say when they're working on themselves. They, they say, you know, if I could just get some peace, if I could just get the crisis, the roller coaster, just to quiet down for, for, for just a minute, I could do this on myself, right? Like, my, if, if the, the chaos around me, it was like, how am I supposed to work on myself while there's so much chaos around me? 
And the answer to that is, that's not a bug, that's a feature. The only place where real work happens is when the bombs are blowing up all around you. It's the great irony. Let life quiet down and then go work on myself. No, no, no. The only place where real work happens is in the place where the bombs are going off around you. Because the bombs going off around you, again, completely removing from this, this calculation any fault that others may have, because it's not going to help me to look into that. Removes the calculation, any fault that others may have. Just looking at my reactions, my reactions. These bombs that are blowing up around me, these stressors, are very, very useful information for me. So, let me get even more pointed here. My self-growth started from surrender, started from letting go. And it continues to be an act of surrender. The areas where my ego overextended its functionality and is getting hurt are the precise areas in which I need to start exercising surrender. So this particular issue that pains me so deeply, that's precisely the issue that I need to give over to God. And I need to be able to say with a full heart, I'm not pursuing an outcome. I put this in your hand. I accept the chaos around me as a necessary process. And I'm willing to stay here humbly, quietly, calmly. Ready to offer any productive act that I can that's of service, but not reacting to the chaotic stimuli. In that sense, I hope it's apparent to you that it's kind of difficult to manufacture this kind of situation. In other words, life puts us to the test. To create this or to simulate it uh, through, through you know, human power to sort of uh, intentionally put yourself to the wall doesn't really work. Perhaps the first type of self-improvement that we're not even talking about can be induced through some type of, you know, manufacture uh, pressure. But what we're talking about is very organic. What we're talking about is we are respecting the rhythm of our life. Life goes through repeated ebbs and flows of ego death and rebirth. Oh, should I not? I should, okay, I'm going to have to. I'm sorry. I should should have put a warning first. If you're going through this the first time, God bless you. It doesn't just happen once. It happens again and again and again. That's not a curse. I'm not trying to scare you out of life. That's the nature of things. We're always growing. Thank God, we're always growing. And when we finally perfect one level of surrender, we will be tested, we'll be tested, and forced to surrender on an even deeper level. So what I'm saying is life creates the test. Life puts us in these dire straits, these Egypts. Egypt is Mitzrayim, Mitzorim, you know, narrow constrictions. And then we surrender, we allow God to remove us, then we have our sphero period of regrowth, and then we have our Shavuos period of being a nice puffy piece of bread, being a healthy ego, where self-esteem is actually love of God, because now our only self-concept is synonymous with our own awareness of our godly soul. And then we do that for a while until we come to a a higher level, 
you know, at relative to the level that we're on, we come to a, a new level called Mitzrayim, dire straits. And we, we do that over and over again. And, and it'll be okay. It'll be okay. First of all, you're on a webinar with hundreds of people right now. So we're all doing this together. So we will be okay. All right. Um, a lot of questions coming in in the chat. And it's hard to uh, keep up. So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to address it all. Um, we, ha we have about a half an hour left tonight, okay? It's a, it's a two-part webinar. So we, we have about a half an hour left tonight. So I want to go to another uh, topic right now, if that's okay. Um, obviously, I mean, I think it's understood this Jewish spiritual faith-based approach to, uh, to this topic. So I want to talk about the issue of secular sources, secular wisdom, secular uh, programs of healing, and how that may or may not be compatible with a Jewish uh, belief system. Particularly because many people who are deeply believing um, and very deeply spiritual, uh, they find some type of outside help, I mean, outside of Judaism, some type of system, whether it's therapy or recovery or the like. And, and sometimes there's guilt about that or, you know, sometimes not guilt, but confusion. Sometimes there's resentment, like, you know, why was this, you know, where, where has this been all my life? Why can't my Jewish life be like this? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that in the remaining time that we have, if that is, if that is okay. Uh, you're probably aware of the fact that the Rambam, that Maimonides, says to receive the truth regardless of its source. Kabbalah sa'amas me misha imre. That's in the Rambam Shmeina Prakim. So first of all, what does it matter where you hear the truth? Maybe it also says this stuff in the holy books. But if you didn't hear it in the holy books, what do you care where you, where you heard it? Um, maybe it says it in the holy books, but you couldn't understand it with, with the way you were looking at things until you heard something that was outside of the holy books. There's a famous Hasidic story. I, uh, I actually, I once, uh, I, I was to a, a Jew in recovery, had many, many years in recovery. And uh, he was like, you know, for years it bothered me. How come... I had to go to these meetings to hear these basic concepts that I, you know, I really, I should have heard this in yeshiva. And retroactively, I look back and I realized that I did, but <laughs> only retroactively. So he's like, you know, it bothered me for years. He says, but then I thought about this, you know, this old, this is a story about the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov, um, he told uh, his students that a um, story about uh, I mean, the punchline is the Ukrainian line, you can, but you don't want, right? So he told them this idea that sometimes, you know, a person says they can, they can, they can, they can, they just don't want to. And then uh, there was this, uh, this wagon driver who was coming into the shul and he was begging them to help him with uh, the, uh, the wagon, the horse was stuck in the mud and they, they were saying, we can't, we can't. And uh, so the, the wagon driver, who wasn't Jewish, he screamed at them in Ukrainian, Mojish Dani Khoshish, you can't, you can, you just don't want to. And I was like, oh, life lesson, life lesson, right? You can, but you don't want to. Aha, 
aha, right? <laughs> Hold on a second. How come they couldn't have learned that life lesson directly from the Baal Shem Tov? How come that didn't click for them until the Ukrainian wagon driver screamed it at them? And the answer is, I don't know, but a famaisa frekunish can kashas. You can't ask why did it happen the way it happened. That's how it happened. In other words, don't ask yourself, well, how come I didn't get it from this source? How come I only got it from that source? I don't know, because that's how God chose to deliver it to you. So you wanted to hear it from the Baal Shem Tov. Instead, Lahavdil, you heard a Iranian wagon driver. The bottom line is you heard the message. And uh, I think one way of understanding this is that Hashem speaks to us through our experiences. And if we're humble, then uh, we can hear the truth that's being communicated to us. And we don't have to get nervous. We don't have scared. Um, why didn't I learn this in a religious context? Because you didn't. Because you didn't. Okay? Now, let me get a little bit deeper. Because although it is true, sometimes we hear life lessons from sources. I do want to be careful about conflating Torah with Lahavdil, any other ideology or wisdom in the world. There is a difference, obviously. But what is that difference? How do, how do we understand that difference? There, there's, a, there's a medrash that says, if somebody tells you that yeshchoch mabagayim, that the nations of the world, meaning the rest of humanity, outside of the Jewish people, has wisdom. Tamin, you should believe that person who tells you that there is wisdom among other, other people other than Jews have wisdom. You should believe them. It's true. But if they tell you, yesh teira bagayim al tamin, if they tell you there's teira among the nations of the world, don't believe them. So what's the difference between Chachma and Torah? So I mentioned before the Rambam. In Shemayna Prakim, he says, Kabbalah Sahim is Mamisha Eben, I receive the truth regardless of its source. The Rambam also says a similar thing in Mishnah Torah, when he's talking about astronomy, about calculating the... Uh, the new moon, and he says that he's using Greek calculations. And he says that really the Jews had their own calculations, uh, but we don't have those, but we, we use the Greek calculations. And uh, it's fine to use those Greek calculations because this is something, he says, these are concepts, meaning the location of the, you know, the moon and things like that. These are things that are readily obvious empirically evident to everybody. What does that mean? That means, yes, I'm relying on the authority of these sources outside of Torah, but for what kinds of things am I relying upon them? I'm, re I'm relying upon them for things that can be demonstrated. So, in other words, if somebody makes a statement that this method works, and then they demonstrate that it works, of course not. You've just demonstrated it. They're not telling me a theory. They're not telling me an idea. They're telling me how something works, and then they're demonstrating how it works. And see for yourself, it works. So the Rambam says it's something like that. Please do not get caught up on whether or not it has Jewish origins or not. Okay. But what then would be the limit? Like, how far can you go with this? And then at what point do you have to say, that's the extent of what wisdom outside of Torah has to offer. So 
look at it like this. Now, I heard somebody explain once that science can explain how, but can never answer why. Why is a philosophical question. How is the question of the mechanics? Like, how does it work, right? So explain to me the process by which something happens, right? Take apart the phenomenon and explain it. That's called explaining the how. But the why means, why should it be this way? What is the meaning? What is the true purpose? No scientist will dare answer that question. They won't try to tell you the purpose, meaning the grand purpose. They might tell you the, the immediate function something has. That's not purpose. That's not why it's that way. That's just describing more of the how. So putting this in terms of self-improvement or working on yourself, a secular method can teach me how to do a particular thing. But it can give me a reason for doing it. And it cannot provide me with a purpose. I have to come into whatever work it is that I'm doing with a sense of purpose, with an answer to the question, why does it have to begin with? If I come to the world outside of Torah and I ask them to tell me what's it all about, why am I here, what's the purpose of my life, as a Jew I'm making a profound error. You know, I, I once wrote an article about this in uh, the Questions and Answers Tommy magazine. Somebody was asking about going to therapy, a religious Jew was asking about going to therapy. And one of the things I said was, look, if you are a religion, you hire a tour guide, you go on a trip, you go, to, you, go to, you go to Rome, and you hire a tour guide to show you around, but you don't tell them that you keep kosher, and you don't tell them that Friday afternoon back in the hotel before sundown, and you just hire them. They're going to give you an itinerary that is going to have, you know, countless halachic issues. It's not their fault because that's not their job. They're, not, they're, they're a tour guide. They're not there to figure out how to avoid halachic issues for you. You should have come in as a and said, here are my limits beforehand. And even if you can't think of all your limits beforehand, when the limits come up, that's your job as a customer to say, oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that because we need to be back in the hotel before, you know, whatever time on Friday afternoon. Therapy in general, by and large, and now ending with a very broad brush, is amoral. My father, Zolgazuntang, is a uh, psychologist. And he told me a joke, mm -hmm. teacher, which I never forgot. He says, there was a guy who goes into a bar. He orders a shot of whiskey. Bartender puts the shot of whiskey on the bar. Guy takes the shot, looks at it. He, 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 he tosses it in the in the bartender's face. And the bartender's soaking wet. He's got the, the whiskey dripping down his face. Get out, of here, get out of here. Next day, the same guy comes in. Bartender sees him. Get out. Get out. He says, no, no, no. I'm going to behave myself. Give me a second chance. Okay, fine. What do you want? Shot of whiskey. The bartender's nervous, but he pours him a shot of whiskey. The guy picks up the shot of whiskey. Looks at it. Splashes it in the bartender's face. Bartender wipes off his face. He says, you get out of here. You're banned for life. Year later, year later, the guy comes in the bar, walks up to the bar, bartender recognizes him. He says, hold on a second. You're banned. Get out of here. The guy says, wait, 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 wait. You haven't seen me in a year, right? He's like, yeah. Well, where, well, where do you think I've been for a year? I've been in therapy. Okay, I've been in therapy. For so you give me another chance. He's like, okay, fine. What do you want? He's like, I want a shot of whiskey. Okay, so the bartender puts the shot glass on and pours whiskey. The guy takes the shot glass full of whiskey, looks at it, <laughs> splashes it right in the bartender's face. 
bartender says, I thought you told me you've been in therapy. The guy says, I have been. Now when I do that, I don't feel bad about it. Okay, anyways, that's the joke my father told me. What's the joke? The, the joke is that, you know, you go to a therapist and say, you know, I have a lot of uh, conflict over the fact I'm throwing drinks in people's face. Well, that's the therapist's job to be like a moral voice. It, it's a joke for a reason. Don't take it so literally, okay? The point is, it's, it's I, real clinical detachment is amoral or close to being amoral, not immoral. Immoral is, I know right from wrong, and I'm going to do right. Amoral means, I'm not concerned with the question of morality. That's not my business. So, for instance, I think times religious Jewish people will go to a marriage counselor who will give them advice that is actually against the halachas of what a Jewish couple needs to do. That's, that's not a bad therapist. They don't know that. That's not their job to study Tata Samishpacha. It's not their problem that they don't know. Just like if you would go on a trip to Rome and the tour guide didn't know that you'd be back in the hotel before sundown. It's your job to speak up and to say, oh, thank you for that suggestion, but here's the, here's the problem that I can't do that. It doesn't work for me, for me, because it doesn't align with my values. But they can't give you values. So you have to come in to the theater process with a sense of values already. They can tell you the how, how things work, what to do, but they can't tell you why, why to, or even why it's worth engaging in this therapy and experiencing healing. They can't even tell you why healing is worthy. Uh, is a worthwhile person. That's something you have to come in with already. Uh, this is a little bit of a, a different subject, but you know, there was a, a shlucha, an emissary, a uh, Chabad emissary uh, in, in Cincinnati, Mrs. Sharfstein, and she became very uh, versed in Montessori. And she went to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And uh, she told the Rebbe of her plans to introduce Montessori in her, uh, in her Hebrew school, or nursery school. And uh, so it's very interesting. The Rebbe told her that you can use the methods, but not the hashkafa. Hashkafa is a Hebrew word which means the, the outlook or the worldview. So it's very interesting that Rebbe distinguished the two things. Like Montessori has two things. There are tools, right, methods, and either the methods work or they don't work, and it's demonstrable. You can see if they work, right? So that is Kabbalah just accept the truth from someone who's saying it. That's like taking astronomy from Greeks. You can see that it works, all right? That's the tools, the methods. But the hashkafa, the world, you know, Montessori comes with a worldview. Don't take your worldview from that. You as a Jew have to come in with a worldview. And in the end, what she called, and she got approval from the Rebbe to call uh, this style of uh, school, she, they, she called it individualized instruction using Montessori materials and methods. That's very long-winded, but necessary. It's not sorry, because she's not following the worldview of Montessori. It's using individualized instruction, using Montessori materials and methods. She's using their materials and their methods. Again, wisdom is telling you how things work. Believe them. And if the tools work, use them. But why something is worth doing, why we do anything, the purpose of life, you have to come into the process with that already. In other words, let me give you another example. Use Montessori as an example. I'll give you another mushal, another uh, analogy. Give me another analogy. Today, this is just a pet peeve, so I'm just using the opportunity to gripe. Um, you see 
because the world right now is very polarized, politically polarized. So even profoundly religious Jews who you would think their worldview would be directly from, from Judaism, they get guided and they've fallen into partisanship. And, you know, whether it's conservatism or liberalism, those are the two, you know, the chocolate and vanilla of today. You know, 100 years ago, it was, uh, you know, communism. Uh, you know, Jews always had, you know, the foreign isms that were out there. And it's always a dangerous thing to, to, to embrace any ism. Because an ism, by definition, means a worldview. An ism or an ology. <laughs> you know, it's like we don't want the isms or the ologies giving us our worldview. We can borrow their tools. We can use what works. And we should use what works. But we have to come into it with our own sense of of meaning. That's why I, I highly suggest to anyone who is um, in some type of you know program of healing, recovery therapy, that in addition to getting the proper outside help, that you have a spiritual mentor to check in with to make sure that everything you're doing is compatible with your with your spiritual needs. Really, you know, they, they, they have to they have to go together. Because after all, you know, let's go back to where we started from. Let's go back to the beginning. Why am I trying to improve anyway? Why am I trying to heal anyway? It's not for me. It's because my maker wants me to make the best of myself that I can. Okay? It's not I chose to do this. It's not it's not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's a demand. It's a requirement. Hashem requires me to be the best me, even when I'm uninterested. Well, since that's the whole basis, then I have to have at least some, uh, some basic God concept, some basic notion of service, of covenant, a contract. That there's, there's, there is one greater than me who requires something of me. And that in order to live up to that, I am thereby bettering myself right now. Another thing that means that this whole thing is predicated on a sense of duty. A duty, a responsibility to be my best self because my maker expects it of me. An another component of this is, you know, eventually life does um, stabilize. Eventually things do get um, normal for a while, at least, right? And that's the most, as you know, that's the most dangerous time. Very, very dangerous because the desperation is gone. The, uh, the gift of, des of desperation is gone. And, uh, you know, when life becomes normal enough, a person starts thinking to himself or herself, you know, I could go back to the dysfunction of self-will. I could go back to the dysfunction of allowing my ego to just run amok. What the heck? Let the chips fall where they may. Will this probably blow up in my face? Yeah, they probably will. But I'm kind of in the mood for some self-destructive entitlement right about now, right? Sometimes you're just hankering for some self-destructive entitlement, right? So when that idea comes up, the answer would be, yeah, it sounds great, but I'm, I'm not allowed. 
You know what I'm saying? I'm not allowed. No one's asking you whether or not you want to keep your sanity or you want to lose it. It's not your prerogative. It's not your prerogative. This is duty. God requires you to live your best life, even when you don't give a damn about yourself for whatever crazy reason. I'll just wrap up for tonight with a, a story, a little vignette, slice of life. I once saw a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, sober alcoholics talking to each other. And uh, one of them was, I mean, he's a guy who had about 20, maybe 25 years sober. And uh, he said to the other guy, who was a little bit newer, probably had less than 10 years, he said to him, if God spoke to you and you knew absolutely certainly that it was God, and he told you, to, would you do it? And he said, no. And the first guy said, I would. And if I wouldn't, then I'm not even sober now. And that really blew me away. Now, obviously, that's a story that really, really, really misinterpreted. If somebody is sick and looking for an excuse, that's a story they could definitely run with. But here's that here's to me pretty clearly. It's not your accomplishment, neither to take pride in nor to hold on to and covet and, and, and become attached to. Your life, your growth is not yours. It doesn't belong to you. It was predicated upon self-surrender. It belongs to God. And therefore, theoretically, if God were to come and tell you, give it all up, you'd have to be ready to give it all up. God said, take a drink, even though you knew that was away. Everything, you have to be ready to throw it away. And conversely, the other side of that same coin is, if God doesn't tell you to throw it away, you have no right to throw it away, even if you don't care anymore. You don't care for the moment. Avram Avinu spent, Abraham, Abraham, my father, spent his entire life being God's PR man, built up monotheism. By showing what a good guy he was, by you know that he was a blessing to, to all the nations, had hospitality, and then God says, "Go slaughter your son." That's terrible PR. If he slaughters his son, then all of these pagans are going to say, "Eh, you're just another one, just like us. you pretended to be so so righteous." From Abraham's perspective. The test wasn't, could he force himself to kill his son? The test was, could he throw away everything that he had built? Take that son that you love and sacrifice him because he's not yours to begin with. Now, in the end, Hashem did not ask him to slaughter Yitzchak. He wanted Yitzchak to live and to have progeny. We are his progeny. But he wanted to show that you don't have it yours. You have it because it's God's and he requires you to have it. So even when you heal and you grow and you find your new life, it's not yours to do as you please with. It's God's. And therefore, if he takes it from you, you give it without attachment. And if he doesn't take it from you, then you're not allowed to let go of it. You're not allowed to say, I'm done with it. Because this is not self-improvement for the heck of it, for the fun of it, for the nobility of it even, for the duty of it. I'll tell you one last story, even though uh, we're quickly out of time, but I'll tell you one last story, and then I'm going to say goodnight.
there's a guy driving down the road and he's bull and uh, he's so miserable he cries out to God and he says God please anything anything I need a new life so sick of my life and all of a sudden when you know it he hears the voice of God right there in his car God says you looking for a new life guys like yeah God says you're in luck I have a new life for you on sale today for a very reasonable price. The guy says, how much? God says, how much you got on you? The guy says, uh, 20 bucks. God says, oh, perfect. Price for your new life today is 20 bucks. He says, well, hold on a second. Remember, he's driving down the road. He's like, look at the gas gauge in the car. It's almost on empty. I'm going to give you my 20 bucks. I'm not going to have money for, for the gas. I'm going to run out of gas in the car can't refuel god says oh. yeah i'm glad you mentioned that i forgot the price for your new life just went up it's twenty dollars in your car you guys like my car oh god if i give you car then how am i going to get to work in the morning god says oh work i forgot you have a job yeah okay price for your new life just went up it's twenty dollars your car and your job you guys like god if you give you my job you know, I can't make a paycheck, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay the mortgage. God says, mortgage? Oh, you're a homeowner. Yeah, I forgot about that. The pre-new life today is $20, your car, your job, and your house. Guy says, God, if I give you my house, where are my wife and children going to live? God says, oh, wife and children. Yeah, the price for happiness, the price for your new life, $20, your car, your job, your house, your wife, and your kids. You got anything more to say? And at this point, the guy realizes he shut up. So he's like, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> So uh, God says, good. Now, before I give you your new life, I'm going to give you a new life. Let me take all that. God takes all the stuff going to give you a new life but before i give you a new life i want to know if you can do something for me can you do something for me and the guy's like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he's not going to speak he knows every time he opens his mouth it gets worse <laughs> god says okay here here's what i want you to do for me you see this uh 20 bucks god says it's not your 20 bucks it's my 20 bucks you had it now i do it's mine 20 dollars is mine god says um I want you to take this $20 and spend it. But it's not yours, it's mine. So you can only spend it on what I want to spend it on. God says, you see this car? It's not your car. You used to have a car just like this. You don't anymore. It's my car. I want you to drive it where I want to go. It's my car. You drive it because it's mine. You only take it where I want to go. You see this Job, God says. It's not your job, God says. It's my job. You show up there and you do business the way I want business done, according to my rules. In this house, God says. It's not your house. It's my house. And I want you to live in my house and use it the way God's house ought to be used. You see this wife and children? They're not your wife and children, God says. They are my wife and children, and you will them accordingly. Can you do all of that for me? The guy says, mm-hmm. God says, good, $20, here's your car, here's your job, here's your house, here's your wife and your kids, and here's your new life. The difference between the old life and the new life is to whom it belongs. We start by giving away the self to its rightful owner. It was never ours to begin with. That was an illusion. The self is not an illusion, but the sense of separate selfhood, autonomous selfhood is an illusion. So we give the self back to its rightful owner. And once we've done that, and the self is now a healthy, godly self, then we can improve it. So first we turn into deflated in Egypt. Then we can work on ourselves 
chesed should be chesed, gvura should be chesed, tefira should be chesed, so on and so forth, then we can be a nice plump loaf of bread on the altar in the temple. Because it's not me. It's him. It's his. It's all his. Okay. Emer to Hashem, God willing, we will continue tomorrow night. Um, I did not respond a lot to the questions or comments. It's just too difficult to do that on the fly. But uh, we had uh, many emails that came in. If you have more emails to send in, please send them in to the address that's on the information about the webinar. Um, and uh, God willing, we'll, uh, we'll uh, deal with some of the questions tomorrow night.